step right up, folks, and see the man who ate the heart of a king. His stomach trembles at nothing, his teeth cut through royal sinew, and his horrifying tail is completely 100% true. Marvel at one of the first ever dinosaur hunters, discoverer of huge unfathomable beasts beyond his comprehension, known 200 years later as the guy who ate weird stuff. My name is Jay Draper, and this is the story of how we remember the past, what you'll be remembered for, and how history will judge you. William Buckland is one of the founding fathers of paleontology. In fact, he gets into it so early that the word paleontology isn't even invented yet. Buckland calls himself a geologist by profession. But even that word is peel the wrapping off new, invented when he was nine years old. And despite that, he writes the first full account of a fossil dinosaur, Megalosaurus, even though the word dinosaur doesn't exist yet either. Born in Axminster in Devon, he starts getting into geology as a boy, exploring the local Devonshire countryside and the area around his school, Winchester College, where he collects fossils and cool rocks. You know, like a normal teenager. He gets into Corpus Christi College in Oxford and he becomes a fellow in 1808, teaching classics to the undergrads and making rock collecting expeditions all over Oxfordshire on the side, riding around the country on horseback in his academic gown. In 1813, he starts working two jobs at once, becoming both the reader in mineralogy and Oxford's first ever reader in geology. Geology at the time is a very new field, looked on with suspicion by some Christians who were worried about this new science challenging the biblical story of creation. At first, Buckland is very keen not to upset the apple cart, stressing to his colleagues that, hey, you might have heard about geologists dating rocks that are older than the Bible says they should be, but that's not anything to do with William Buckland, no sir. He explains in his lecture Vindiciae Geologicae, Vindiciae Geologicae? Vindici... Vindiciae Geologicae? Vin... Vindiciae Geologicae... Ge Geologicae... Geologicae... He explains in his lecture that the strata of gravels around Oxford are good evidence of Noah's flood from the book of Genesis. Something he will gently walk back over the course of his career. His lectures are also well known in Oxford for being fun, rather than having some dreary robed chap droning on in Latin about dead Greeks, Buckland brings in maps and drawings to show and passes round his cool rock samples. He throws in jokes and gets down on all fours, showing how the various extinct animals of Oxfordshire would walk and run. Sometimes he even says, it's such a nice day today, why don't we have lectures outside? and takes his students on horseback field trips to quarries and hills around Oxford. His lectures are so popular that it isn't just students turning up, famous figures of the day like the priest John Henry Newman and the geologist Charles Lyle drop in to see Buckland do his impression of a megalosaurus. Lest you think the life of a Georgian geologist is all pleasant pony rides and swanning around in the sunshine though, Buckland is also not afraid to get his hands dirty really dirty. In 1821, he does an excavation in Kirkdale Cavern, where he finds the bones of all sorts of animals you wouldn't expect to find in the middle of Yorkshire. Hyenas, elephants, hippopotamuses, rhinos, oxen and bears. Now, he isn't the first to find exotic animals in Britain. Farmers have been accidentally digging up mammoth bones since there have been farmers. But in Buckland's day, the most common explanation for them was that they were brought over by the Romans, maybe to fight in gladiatorial arenas. But why are these guys in a cave? Why would the Romans put them there? Buckland shows that in fact, the hyenas must have lived wild in the cave, dragging their prey in for safekeeping and a more relaxed dining experience. 
He even gets modern hyenas and feeds them ox bones and goes through their poop afterwards to show that the bone shards that come out the other end are just the same as the pieces of ox bone from the cave. They can only get that way by passing through a hyena first. Never let anyone tell you paleontology isn't glamorous. The very next year, he receives a letter from a woman in Wales whose daughter, Mary Theresa Talbot, along with her friends John and Daniel Davies, have been finding mammoth bones in a place near Swansea called Paviland Cave. When Buckland visits in January 1823, he finds one of the first modern humans in Britain and the oldest fossilised human remains then discovered. Although he doesn't realise it. Just six inches below the surface of the cave, Buckland finds a partial skeleton, missing the head and most of the right-hand side, covered in a red ochre earth that has stained the bones bright crimson. The skeleton is carrying periwinkle shells in his pocket and has pieces of ivory on his chest. We now know that this man in Paviland Cave lived 35,000 years ago, in a period that eggheads call by its Latinate name, the Upper Paleolithic, but which sounds much cooler when you translate it into English as the Old Stone Age. Paleontologists have since found evidence of several much earlier human species, like Homo heidelbergensis and Homo neanderthalensis, living in Britain, but the man from Paviland was a fully modern Homo sapiens, one of the first we know of on the island. He would have lived in a hunter-gatherer society, when Britain was much more sparsely populated. Around the world, Paleolithic humans like the man from Paviland are figuring out cave painting, making it to Australia, and even taking up the art of fishing. But we're yet to cotton on to farming and all that entails. Unfortunately, Buckland doesn't know any of this. In 1823, we're still a long way away from the understanding that extinct animals like mammoths even lived alongside humans, let alone radiocarbon dating or human evolution. So he puts the Paviland man in the Roman period, a mere 2,000 years old. Buckland also, after some wavering, decides that the skeleton is female, which has led to it being known by the nickname the Red Lady of Paviland, even now, long after we've figured out that it's not, in fact, a lady. He's AFAB, assigned female after burial, Paviland man says trans rights. <laughs> Buckland even comes up with a couple of different ideas as to the Red Lady's life. Maybe he was a murdered Roman tax collector, stashed in the cave by his killers who were smuggling illegal goods into the province. Maybe he was a sex worker following the Roman army into Wales. Maybe he was even a witch, using the animal shoulder blades around him to tell fortunes. Although Buckland is wrong about most of the fine details, the discovery of the Red Lady alone would be enough to put him in the history books as one of humanity's great early contributors to paleontology. But he's got more up his sleeve yet. So, he's earning 200 a year from his two readerships. Like, not amazing money, but enough to scrape by as a single middle-class man in Oxford. Then all of a sudden, the plum position of Canon of Christchurch Cathedral opens up, and Buckland's friends lobby to make sure he gets it. This job comes with a whopping £1,000 a year, plus house. It's so much easier to contribute knowledge to the world if you have a stable income at patreon.com slash jdraperlondon. Finally, Buckland has enough money to marry, and he chooses the lovely Mary Morland. Morland is a geologist, scientific illustrator and naturalist in her own right, albeit one shut out of a formal Oxford education. Before she marries Buckland, she's already developed a close friendship with the early geologist Christopher Pegg, on whom she makes such an impression that he leaves her his fossil and mineral collection when he dies, which she promptly brings to the new house. She teaches herself to mend and clean fossils and make models of them for further study, and she illustrates Buckland's books, which are in large part written by her from his dictation and edited by her. And together, they fill their new house to the brim with cool rocks and exotic pets. 
drop by the Buckland place and you might see guinea pigs running over the table or a pony popping its head in the kitchen door and in the garden shed, a fox, jackdaws, magpies or chickens. But Buckland's big contribution to paleontology, the thing that lands him in the history books, happens in 1824 when he publishes Notice on the Megaloceros or Great Fossil Lizard of Stonesfield. In it, Buckland details several odd bones, beautifully illustrated in his paper by Mary, that have washed up in the Oxford Museum's collection over the years that belong to no animal yet known to science. A huge lizard, nine metres long, with massive sharp teeth. He describes and names this dinosaur before we even have the word dinosaur, calling it Megaloceros, which means... Big Lizard. It's a pretty vague name for a dinosaur, but like I said, we don't really know about dinosaurs yet. Buckland doesn't even have the whole thing. All he has is a bit of the spine, hips, one back leg, and a jaw with some teeth in it. Like the Red Lady of Paviland, he doesn't get everything right first time. Uh, he thinks that Megaloceros walked on all fours and was amphibious, like a huge crocodile. Whereas now we know that it walked on two legs and it was shaped a bit like a T-Rex. But before the discovery of T-Rex in the US in the 1870s, Megaloceros is the carnivorous dinosaur. Pictured in books, stomping around Oxfordshire, taking chunks out of smaller beasts left, right and centre. And that brings us to today's sponsor, the Jurassic period. Unlike the Cretaceous T-Rex, Megaloceros was a true Jurassic dinosaur, living 170 million years ago. That's so old that it's older than spider webs, older than flowers, older than the Atlantic Ocean. The continents were still joined together. This means that animals could walk all over and find themselves in what look like very different places to us today. For example, Brachiosaurus was in both Tanzania and Wyoming, and Stegosaurs are found as far apart as Lindy in Tanzania, Chongqing in China, and Swindon in England. Back then, Stonesfield, where Buckland's Megaloceros was found, was hot, humid, and swampy. This is also the period where Megaloceros' smaller theropod relatives started evolving into actual, honest-to-goodness birds like Archaeopteryx. So it shared Stonesfield with pterosaurs and small mammals perfect for a mid-morning snack, as well as bigger, massive, lumbering herbivores like Cetiosaurus. The first 100 species to sign up will get their Central Atlantic Magmatic Province erupted free for the first 30 millennia. The Jurassic. It's not just a park anymore. Today, the species that Buckland called Megaloceros is now properly called Megaloceros bucklandii, after its namer. And new Megaloceros species are still being found as late as 1985 and as far away as Tibet. Buckland twice becomes the president of the Geological Society, as well as a fellow of the Royal Society and the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. His work is still referred to by paleontologists and natural history museums 200 years on. But that's not what most people are interested in. You want to know about creepy English guys putting gross things in their mouths. So it's true, William Buckland also has a much more bizarre hobby, which is <sighs> to eat his way through the animal kingdom. The Bucklands host dinner parties where they serve hedgehogs, toasted field mice, crocodile steak, and puppies. And supposedly, Buckland's menu included the heart of a king. If you read any pop history about Buckland, they will tell you how he visits the stately home at Newnham Park and is shown the preserved heart of Louis XIV, the Sun King. When Buckland is shown it, he says, I have eaten many strange things, but I have never eaten the heart of a king before. And before anyone can stop him, he reaches out and stuffs it into his mouth. 
What a wild story! Can you believe that? Scientists sure are nutty! In fact, this story comes from the travel writer Augustus Hare, and I know this because several articles mention Hare by name. Which is a mistake on their part, because it means you can just read Hare's book and check. So, the part about a French king's heart being embalmed separately isn't totally implausible. The practice of cutting out the heart to be buried separately to the body was once a relatively common practice among European nobility, especially in the days before refrigeration when you might die weeks or months away from the church where your family is buried. That way, the rapidly mouldering body can be buried where you die, and the heart can be embalmed and brought home. We know that Henri III's heart was buried separately to his body, and that Louis XVII's heart was removed by the surgeon who performed his autopsy, pickled in alcohol, and kept in a crystal urn as recently as 1795, although it is now most definitely in the Royal Basilica at Saint-Denis. But Hare does not deign to give us any clue as to which French king's heart ends up being passed around at the Newnham dinner table on that fateful night. So the bit about Louis XIV is a guess someone has made up along the way about which king it could be that's been repeated in dozens of articles ever since. In fact, Hare wasn't even there. He's relating a story that he got second or possibly even third hand. It's just as likely that this didn't happen at all. Someone knew Buckland's reputation for eating weird things and they spun a good yarn round the port decanter one night that ended up taking off. Or perhaps his host at Newnham Park believed he had the heart of a French king, but he didn't have any authentication for that. It's just as possible he got sold a shriveled up bit of pig's heart and told it was a French king. What is true is that Buckland does eat a lot of weird animals. This was something that was written about by his children, and if you're wondering, Buckland variously reports that the worst creatures he's ever eaten are a mole and a blue bottle. So this is normally where people leave the story. Hey, what a weird dude. People in the past sure were morons. And gross. You're not like them. You only eat normal animals, which means you must be smart and clean even if you've never given a second thought to which animals you eat and why. And I'm not immune to this. I'm going to have to call this video something like The Man Who Ate a Human Heart or Why This Guy Ate His Way Through the Animal Kingdom because no one will click on it otherwise. You wouldn't have clicked on it otherwise, you fool! You fell into my trap! You came to see the cannibal freak and instead you've been learning about historical sources! But Buckland's gastronomic experiments aren't simply the result of idle curiosity. He may have had a greater purpose in mind. So far as I know, he never directly said why he cooked and ate so many different animals in a way that survived in the historical record. But there are some clues. Buckland is an early member of London Zoo, which in 1825 produces a founding document detailing their main aim – the introduction of new varieties, breeds and races of animals for the purpose of domestication, being a society bearing the same relations to zoology that the horticultural society bears to botany. In other words, when it is first founded, the zoo wants to be a kind of garden centre for the animal kingdom, finding new animals both for the plough and for the dinner table. It makes a certain kind of sense. As the British Empire is expanding, British naturalists are realising just how many different species there are in the world, and at the same time, just how few are domesticated. Perhaps, they wonder, there's an animal out there that would be better at making wool than a sheep, or would make sausages faster and tastier than a pig. Surely it can't be that the few animals we decided to domesticate thousands of years ago just happened to be the best and most profitable ones to domesticate. Maybe there are animals out there that can make things we haven't even thought to use yet. So let's put them all together in a big park where we can study them and find out if and how they can be useful. Like I said, 
There isn't anything from Buckland directly stating this, but perhaps he hopes that his culinary adventures in the animal kingdom might yield cheaper, tastier, more plentiful food for London's poor, or easily transportable foodstuffs to be grown in Britain's colonies, though it's hard to see how French king's hearts could be a scalable resource. You'll be happy to know that the zoo doesn't think like this anymore. They're not keeping penguins there just in case one hatches that tastes good. Now we know that we didn't pick random animals to domesticate and just got lucky. The reason we farm such a small number of animals is because there's only a few that can be farmed. But Buckland doesn't know that, and I'm afraid you wouldn't either if you were born in 1784. Sometimes the actions of people in the past seem unfathomable to us, but my favourite thing about history is to fathom them as best I can. Buckland gave history a huge wealth of new information on dinosaurs and extinct animals and early humans, but the way his story is told also asks us a question. What do you do today that future generations will think is weird and gross.